the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Decided this morning to, to preach on the epistle reading from 2 Corinthians. If it's been a few minutes since we've heard that. If you want to look at it in your bulletin, you can. And now you're thinking, oh no, a sermon on giving. <laughs> Sorry. Actually, we hardly ever preach on giving and stewardship. Hardly ever. Once in a while, usually the beginning of the year, Stewardship Sunday, we say something about giving. That's about it. So don't complain. I don't want to hear it. I ran across, I will be concise this morning, I ran across this very recently. Uh, there's a fine line between a long, drawn-out sermon and a hostage situation. <laughs> I am not holding a gun to your head or threatening you in any way. Today, the, the Apostle Paul challenges us with this truth of the gospel that he who spares, pardon me, he who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. He who sows sparingly will also reap sparingly. The Apostle presents us with an opportunity to consider and reconsider our attitudes toward giving ourselves and our resources to consider how much we give back to God from what he's given to us. And the context of this statement, of course, is not the Apostle Paul looking to pass a new church budget or the Apostle Paul looking for a raise. He's trying to raise money for Christians who are suffering back in Jerusalem. It's, a, it's charity. The Apostle challenges us to, in today's epistle to consider what we would call our spiritual investment in our own future. Similar to the parable of the soils that we read last week, where the Lord compares seed to God's message to us, the Apostle uses the metaphor of a farmer sowing seeds. A farmer who sows sparingly only what he thinks is the bare minimum that will grow, that what, he, what he needs to get his crop will suffer loss. What will happen? You know what will happen. Bad weather, drought, heat, pests will devastate his harvest because he's sown sparingly. The smart farmer, on the other hand, does what? He sows generously. He puts more seed in the ground than he thinks he may need because he knows that some of the seed won't sprout. What about us? You and me, we sow the seeds of our time our talents and our treasure. We invest ourselves in God's program, in his kingdom, in order to reap a harvest for our souls. What's the apostle saying here? People who are satisfied with occasional church, and I realize you're here, I'm preaching to the choir. People who are satisfied with occasional church, people who rarely pray, rarely give to God's work, rarely give themselves through service to God, are missing out on the blessings that God has for them. It's often the, the case that those who are stingy with God and with His church are the ones who struggle most with faith in God and His provision in their lives, both physical and spiritual. They suffer from anxiety, and they're more easily enticed by the love of money. They struggle to understand God's central place in their lives. They don't realize that their life, including their money, is not their own. It all belongs to God, and our Christian life is sacramental in nature. Let me explain that. While warning us that those who spare so, so sparingly will also reap sparingly, the Apostle Paul assures us that the reverse is also true. If you sow bountifully, you'll reap bountifully. This belief is lived out in our faith since the beginning of the church. It's what we call sacramental living. Remember that giving begins with God. God gives everything to us. He gives us our lives, our time. He gives us immortality. We never give anything to God that he has not given to us. A wonderful example of sacramental living is seen in the theology of the Eucharist that we have just partaken of God enables us to grow the wheat and the grapes that we harvest in order to make bread and wine. We offer these gifts to the Lord in the Eucharist, the Eucharistia. He blesses them and transforms them into the holy body and blood of Christ, the medicine of immortality. 
which is true food and drink, which if we do not eat of it, the Lord says, we will have no life in ourselves. The Eucharist unites us with God. So it is with giving to the church. God enables us to labor, to be productive. We earn wages. We give a portion, a first fruit, back to God to build up his church. He receives these gifts, and he transforms them into spiritual blessings for us. These gifts provide for the ministries of the church that feed our souls spiritually, the gifts that help grow his church, that benefit everyone. Let me remind you that God does not need our money. God doesn't need us. He doesn't need anything. To quote Bono, you know who he is, the God I believe in isn't short on cash, mister. We need to give. Giving is part of being a Christian. It's part of our expression of faith in God. Giving is good for us. Christ speaks repeatedly in the Gospels about the danger of money, its corrupting effects. We preach about this regularly. The Lord warns us to put money and things back into their proper place. And our giving back to God is an antidote to greed and selfishness. It's a medicine for the infection of materialism. And of course, our giving to God and the church is never just meant to be about money. We give ourselves first, which means our treasure, but also our time and our talents. What we give of ourselves now impacts our future and the future of the whole community. We build on the foundation that Christ has laid for us in the founding of this local church, which is part of his body, so that we can continue to grow and provide for the needs of all those who come to be a part of this church family. In our parish, the needs and opportunities to serve are always there. Just think how this parish will continue to grow if we give the first fruits of our time, our treasure, our talents to help provide for the parish, which provides for the spiritual needs of the parishioners and for others, and this parish has served as a spiritual hospital for many for the past 100 years. And it is not just how much we give, but it's our attitude toward giving. Today the apostle invites us not to give grudgingly, but he says to give cheerfully. In Greek, God loves a joyful, a cheerful giver. You recognize the root of our word, hilarious. I've always thought that this was a very interesting turn of phrase. Think about it. It makes perfectly good sense. God is not interested in us going through the motions, doing religious stuff when our hearts aren't in it. It matters how we treat God. Can you imagine getting a birthday gift from someone you know and they say to you what? Here's your gift. I didn't want to get you anything, but I felt obligated, so I had to go buy you something. My wife told me I had to get your gift, get you a gift. Here's your lousy gift. I wouldn't take it. I would tell him to keep it. Today we're invited, invited to sow bountifully so we can also reap bountifully. How do you want to be received into God's kingdom in the future. What's missing from your life in Christ right now? What can be strengthened? Where, where does your faith and trust need to grow? Where do you want to see Christ make a difference in your life, through your life, and the blessings he's entrusted to you? If for whatever reason you struggle to open your hand to God, to get outside yourself, to serve and to give, I encourage you just to trust his promise. Take a step of faith. Christ offers us an opportunity to take that step of faith today, every day, to get outside of ourselves, to love and to serve, to continue to grow individually and corporately in communion with Christ. As we do so, the apostle assures us that we will grow as a community in spirit and in numbers, and this, of course, will benefit everyone. One Sunday in the fall, Mrs. Pappas gave her little girl, Soteria, some money and asked her to put some money in the offering plate. She didn't have a lot of cash. Nobody carries cash, right? She gave her a dollar and she gave her a quarter. 
After the offering plate was passed at the end of the liturgy, Mom then, of course, asked little Soteria what she put in the plate. Well, she said, I was going to put the dollar in, but then Father said we should be cheerful givers. And I knew I'd be a lot more cheerful if I put the quarter in instead. <laughs> you laugh, but Soteria is doing okay. She has the message. She understands she needs to give something to God. She's willing to give, and she gave what? 20% of what she had. Pretty good. Of course, she probably wasn't quick enough to make change from the offering plate either, right? She wasn't thinking quickly enough. Anyway. Seriously, someone once said, and I don't know who this was, it's an it's anonymous quote, the happiest people on earth are the people who discovered the joy of giving. The happiest people on earth are the people who discover the joy of giving. That's not in the Bible, but I believe that's true. Giving says that God has blessed me, and I love him, and I want to be a blessing to other people. I do. Give of yourself and you'll receive more in return. No one who sows abundantly will be disappointed by God's outpouring. The apostle finishes this little passage in 2 Corinthians with this statement. He says, the one who sows, pardon me, the one who supplies seed to the sower and bread for food will supply and multiply your seed and increase the harvest of your righteousness. You will, are being enriched in every way for all generosity, which through us produces thanksgiving to God. Amen. Please stand.